Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our latest uh, installment in the webinar series here. And today our topic is feeding the Jersey heifer. And my name is Laura Daniels and just briefly, I, I also own a, a dairy herd, a Jersey herd in Cobb, Wisconsin. Um, I'm happy to have the chance to help uh, put these webinar series on uh, because I myself have been in the nutrition field for over 20 years. And recently I've switched gears and I'm working more on the people side of the cow business. And so I'm happy to have all of you join us and also happy that Jersey is supporting such a great series of um, additional information to help each and every one of you, whether you're a producer or a nutritionist looking to learn a little bit more about what makes jerseys the same and different than other breeds. Today, we will hear from Dr. Bob James, and he is with Down Home Heifer Solutions. The video will also feature Jim Hufford from Hufford Dairy Farms, and, uh, and together they will work on telling us more about how to feed Jersey heifers. The broadcast will be 22 minutes long, and after that, we will have a live question and answer session with Dr. Bob James. So please, as your questions come to your mind, use the, the questions or the chat function, which is located at the right hand of your screen. That is the best way for us to receive those questions. So please do feel free to send those questions and we'll be sure to get them to Dr. James at the end during the question and answer period. Just so you know, only the presenters will be able to see those questions as they come in. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get that video started. Hi, I'm Bob James, and uh, my business is called Down Home Heifer Solutions, and I'm here at Hufford Dairy Farm uh, with Jim Hufford, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, feeding Jersey heifers. And uh, just a little bit about me, um, I started my consulting business, really uh, focuses on calves and heifers, and uh, kind of uh, throughout North America. Uh, I retired after a career of 35 years in teaching, research, and extension in, uh, at Virginia Tech in the Department of Dairy Science. I had a small nutritional consulting business for about 15 years, and, uh, and I also had, uh, I have some registered jerseys. My prefix is down home, uh, down home jerseys, and, and some of them are housed here at, uh, at Hufford Dairy Farm. Um, so what's special about feeding Jersey heifers? Well, what do we know that's different what do we know that's not different? And where do we really need to have some additional research? Well, we're going to begin with, and I'm, I'm a scientist, we're going to begin with some scientific principles. And this applies to all, really all breeds. Heifers have requirements for maintenance. They have requirements for growth. And the requirements for repo are relatively minor. Let's talk a little bit about some historical perspective of, of feeding jerseys. Well, I think a lot of times people said, well, these jerseys are a little on the small side and therefore they eat less and, and we want to be careful that we don't overfeed them. And particularly for calves, gosh, they're a little calf and, and if we feed them too much, they're going to get diarrhea. And, and the other problem that I see is in mixed breed herds um, where they're grouped with Holsteins. They want to put them with the same size Holsteins, and, and that's really a problem, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Everyone's seen growth charts, and I really have a problem with these growth charts because they're all based on Holsteins. And, uh, the, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the problems with these growth, growth charts uh, a little bit later. Now, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of research that's been conducted on Jersey calves, on heifers, and mostly in, uh, in Jersey calves. Uh, we did some work at Virginia Tech. Uh, this was done by Scott Bascom, who actually had worked for Jersey for a while and is a member of AJCA. But what we found out through some feeding studies is that the maintenance requirements of these jerseys is actually higher than Holsteins because they have more surface area. So they get rid of body heat a lot more quickly and this presents some challenges in the winter time. So rather than limit feeding these guys we need to we need to feed them really pretty well and when you look at that um, why does jersey milk have so much fat and protein 
Well, it's not to make cheese, it's really to feed that calf a whole lot better, and I think sometimes we tend to, to uh, ignore that. This research really led to the, um, the development of the, of the Cows Match Jersey Blend or the Jersey Blend Milk Replacer by Land O'Lakes, and, and I do want to give some recognition to them because they, they funded that Jersey research. There's also been some work done at Texas Tech uh, with calves and a feeding uh, about nine tenths of a pound of a 2020 uh, milk replacer and that's on a solids basis so that's a little over three quarts versus 1.3 pounds a day which is probably about five and a half quarts a day of a 2820. Now with their old logic, gosh these calves on higher intake and higher solids ought to have more diarrhea and have more problems. Well what we found out is that the energetic efficiency was the same. There's really no difference at all in diarrhea and that uh, these calves that were fed that 2820 actually gained weight for the first four weeks. Uh, they retained more nitrogen, they retained more, had more uh, lean tissue growth and uh, with really no detrimental effects so, so we can really feed these calves. But our focus today is going to be for weaning uh, to calving and I want to take a science-based approach on that. Um, the National Research Council really establishes nutrient requirements for dairy cattle. Our last edition was in 2001, and uh, the new one's going to be coming out shortly. And we establish nutrient requirements for growth by doing a feeding trial. We measure the amount of protein, the fat, the ash that we feed, and we measure what's excreted. And we also have to measure what that growth is in terms of body composition. You know, is it lean tissue growth? Is it fat tissue growth? And so these things are really very important. And in the 2001, we really don't have a lot of Jersey data in there, and some of that's based on, on beef data. But the bright spot is on the new one, we are going to have some, some dairy data in there, and specifically from some Jerseys uh, that we've done at Virginia Tech. So NRC uses a targeted system for growth. And by what that means is, let's look at the mature weight of animals within the herd. And, uh, and that varies by, by breed and then really with genetics for stature within breed. So we look at what's the current age and body weight of that group of animals in question and what's our target calving body weight at first calving. And what's going to be the chemical composition of that weight gain and then what are our requirements that we need to, for them to reach those goals. So here's a key message and I think when you think about this, it's kind of logical. As animals mature, they accumulate protein and fat. But the percent protein in gain declines with age, and the percent fat increases with age. And we, we show this by, by the following two figures, and I think this shows it. So we have an accretion of body protein, but the percentage goes down. So where we're gonna get the best lean tissue growth is really in some animals like this. Some of these younger animals are the ones that are really going to, to have some very economical and some good lean tissue growth. And this applies to the calves and these younger animals. Now, as they get older, the amount of fat composition increases. And so that's something that we need to be very careful of is not over fattening some of these animals. So we've got some milestones, and there's really a great publication that Jersey has out, and uh, heifers should achieve a target percentage of mature body weight at some milestones in life. And let's look at the milestones of puberty and breeding weight at third estrus and calving at the desired age. And we scale then our nutrient requirements based upon the breed, the genetics within the breed, and when we want them to calve. Now, the key, the key message for Jerseys is that these guys are going to mature sooner and so at the same body weight they're a lot more mature and uh, uh, than a Holstein would be and they're going to fatten more if we put jerseys in with the same size uh, at the same size Holstein well what about height and I think a lot of people like to set goals for height and that's a real challenge and so what, you know, what are your goals for, for height in, uh, in, in the jerseys that you have, Jim? Our goal is just to have them tall enough. Okay. And I think that varies, you know, and, and probably unless you're a show person, 
yeah. stature I think we've shown is really maybe not a real great goal to have and, right. and we want to have an animal that's going to be profitable and I think almost all of our research shows that might be the intermediate size. Mm -hmm. Now here's the key thing and I think that we forget. <coughs> We want to meet their nutrient requirements, and this is essentially what Jim's saying, to reach their genetic potential for height. Now, I can make a heifer with the genes for tall stature short by just not feeding them enough protein. If I'm feeding corn silage and some of this common, this average quality grass hay, they're going to be short and dumpy, okay? Now, the reverse of that is I can't take a heifer that has the genes for intermediate stature or low stature and make them tall by feeding them a lot of protein. That's expensive, it's nutritionally inefficient, and it's really bad for the environment because they're gonna be excreting all that excess nitrogen. People say, well, boy, I feed all that protein, and the challenge that we have is, yeah, they're thinner because they're using energy to excrete some of that surplus nitrogen. And so, how do you implement this targeted growth? Well, first question you have to ask is, what's my herd? You know, what Jersey sires do I use, you know, for stature? Do I have a mixed breed herd? Um, do I have crossbreds? And then we establish goals for, for growth based upon mature size. The first goal we have is I'd like these calves to double their birth weight in the first 56 days. And that's not a real challenging goal. That's about 1.1 pounds a gain a day. <coughs> I know some Jersey guys that are tripling. In fact, you look at the size of these heifers here. These are three and four month old heifers and they're probably gaining more than 1.1 pounds a day. And, and, and look at the body condition. You know, they're really looking pretty nice in terms of, of their body condition. Um, so you tailor your goals. Now there's a really nice chart that gives some examples of target weights and required gains for calves and heifers with expected mature body weights of a thousand pounds. And we can look at the starting weights and the required gain per day for each one of those, <coughs> each one of those targets. And uh, that's shown at this attached table. So how do we implement this? Well, we talked about in, in mixed breed or cross breeds that are moving towards all Jersey genetics and gem boys, I go around the country, I see a lot of herds that are moving towards jerseys and I think for, for many different reasons. This is a lot more challenging. And in the ideal scenario, I'd, I'd probably like to, to group them by breed because those jerseys are at a different stage of their maturity at a given body weight. Um, if we have a mixed group of calves, then we've almost got to scale them by reproductive management. In other words, these jerseys are going to be maturing two to three months sooner than a Holstein. So it means I put a smaller, younger Holstein in with bigger, older, I mean smaller, younger jersey in with larger, older Holsteins. And, uh, and that sounds a little, a little risky, but, but that's what, now, key things there. Um, <coughs> You got to have enough bunk space and we'll talk about some of the management things. So I think some challenging areas for heifer management and you know where I see problems and I think this is a really great example on the wean calves and I'm not sure that jerseys have more problems but this is a great example here of I think where animals really make a, a great transition from milk to a, a calf starter. We look at the quality of this calf starter here and boy you know, the, the question I always ask is, do they eat it, okay? And this stuff looks good, it's pelleted, and I think one of the nice things that I like about a pellet is every bite's the same, and uh, as compared to a textured feed, and I see people get arguing about which is better, well, I just say, will they eat it? And I like the uniformity here, and so uh, uh, we got some good intake. How much are these guys eating on this, on this, this group here a day? Yeah, we, we give them almost all they'll okay. eat, so that's, they'll eat probably eight pounds. Okay, time. yeah, so they're, they're really eating it really so pretty we're, well. we're growing them right now. That's right. And, you know, and, and the thing that's really important on this, and I think is important regardless of heifers, is you have to look at what they look like. That's right. Okay, and you have to evaluate body condition. Now, these guys will grow awfully well, but as they get a little bit older, we've really got to temper that by their body condition, by their body condition. So again, this transition, calf starter, some forage, um, and really don't 
try to economize too quickly. You know, I see folks, this is expensive feed on a cost per pound basis. And I see people trying to shift them too quickly to a cheaper feed and, and boy, there's where we can really create some problems. The second challenge we have, and that's that we're going from individual housing that Jim group feeds his baby calves. And so that eliminates that one transition. And uh, I don't know, have you been pretty successful with, with group housing your uh, Jersey calves and feeding them with a bar feeder? It's been very good. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, as you get more calves, you may change some of what we do. Okay. It's worked very well. The key thing that I've seen here that is, is, that, is that they manage that system very well. And there's somebody always kind of monitoring those calves that are on that bar feeder. The other important point is we've got enough bunk space for all these calves. So everybody can get in here and eat at the same time, and that's not going to be limiting. Um, you'll see some discussion about limit feeding heifers and the fact that it might be a little bit more nutritionally efficient. Well, I've got some problems with that with jerseys because we all know they have some oral issues and they like to roll their tongues. And, and, uh, and this can be really challenging if we're limited in bunk space, if not everybody can get in there and feed. And the other problem is, and you'll see this in Jersey herds where they limit feed, is boy, everybody is tongue rolling. And if that barn's not built out of steel, they're going to chew it to the ground in a hurry because they're bored. And I think, you know, this is a, I guess it's a personal observation that, that uh, Jerseys are a little bit more oral than, uh, uh, than some other breeds. So, implementing it, monitor body condition, adjust your diets based on condition. And this one, you ought to routinely weigh some heifers. And I talk about r routinely weighing them at some, some milestones. At birth, at weaning, when they come into a group pen, anytime we have to handle them, and you'll say that, boy, this is an awful lot of extra effort. Well, we weigh milk and cows. How do we evaluate our heifer program? And I've been on farms where this is all part of their management scheme, is they've developed a pretty sound record-keeping system for their heifers. Again, I'd refer you to the really great publication of growing a, a heifer from the Jersey Association, and it talks about some of the key records that, that one ought to be uh, do, ought to be follow, or ought to be recording. And so, develop that means to monitor growth. And I've shown a, a couple of examples from some farms that I've worked with, monitoring mortality, monitoring uh, calf barn weaning weights, and to really give us an idea. The last message I think that I, I want to give uh, here is uh, you also need to train your employees on handling Jersey heifers. They are a little bit different and, uh, and that's called stocklandship and I think we're finding out some things that, that that's just really awfully important. So summarize, what do we know about Jerseys that's different? They mature sooner than Holsteins. You know, we ought to be shooting for 22 month age at first calving exactly. and, uh, and I think that's a real they should be fed and bred to calve at an earlier age, so capture that genetic advantage. Uh, in mixed breed herds, we know we've got some challenge. If you can group them separately, that's great. If they are mixed groups, you've got to put younger, smaller jerseys in with older Holsteins and have enough bunk space so that they can compete well. But what's not different? These animals have requirements for, for growth and maintenance, which really govern how they should be fed. And so this is where I think we need some more information, quite frankly. Uh, I think we've got some really great information that's going to be available in our next nutrient requirements, particularly for some of the younger calves. But ultimately, it's, you know, it, it's looking at that animal. It's having the body weights, but then also combining that with, with, with looking at body condition. I think that's one of the really great things here that I've had experience with working with Upper Dairy is, boy, the people here are, are really good Hellman and uh, at combining the data as well as as the uh, uh, the practical experience. So again, uh, real pleasure being here at uh, Hufford Dairy Farm. Jim, you have any other parting words of wisdom on feeding Jersey heifers? Good question for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, in some of my uh, travels in uh, herds where we're transitioning from say Holstein to Jersey, and they have their pre-puberty or up to breeding age heifers can find. Uh, they're used to feeding Holsteins, so their Jersey heifers are getting way overweight. Yep. So what are your maybe recommendations for them how to feed or how to manage those? 
Yeah, I think there's some, that, that's a really good point. And that comes with evaluating body condition. But the jerseys, boy, when I've seen nine, ten months of age, they can they can get chunky on us they in a hurry. Real <laughs> and in, in some ways, I hate to say it, we have to dumb down the rations a little bit. We've got to put some lower energy forages in that diet. Right. And I think this is a good example maybe of, of some younger animals, but Jim's got some average quality grass hay. And combined with this cast charter here, which has a fairly high level of molasses, it's a really excellent quality molasses. This is a great complement. You know, you've given enough of that scratch factor in the rumen. Uh, we've lowered that energy concentration down a little bit. And we've got a, a pretty healthy rumen. You look at, at the health of these calves, you look at the manure. Now we look at those older animals. You know, if we're using corn silage, we almost have to chop up and put some straw or chopped grass hay in there, some way to get that energy down in there or they will get chunky on us. And boy, you talk about having some breeding problems. Uh, you know, from a personal experience, when I've kind of let that slip a little bit, it's it's been a real challenge. And and that's been the hardest thing, I think, for Holstein guys to understand is you can breed a 10-month-old Jersey heifer, you know, and, and still be very, very successful and very profitable. And it didn't take as much as corn silage or energy or nope. whatever to get her that. That's way. right. And that's one thing that I think a Holstein breeder has yep. to learn. And well, we, you know, you look at cost per day, and you can look at that two ways. I have a whole lot fewer days of feeding these jerseys, okay, by getting that earlier age at first calving. I remember the last calf that I sent down here to you, and, and you looked at her coming off the truck and said, golly day, how old is that heifer? And I said, well, oh, she's about 10 months old. She's already pregnant, you know, and, and she calved and I think scored uh, very good and made 16,000 pounds as, a, as a, about a 20-month-old heifer. And, uh, and so these things are possible when we dial in that heifer ration correctly and, and get the right kind of conditions. So maybe one more question for you is in your travels uh, and your work, ventilation and young calves yep. and water availability, I think that's a big issue that yep. maybe you could... Uh, yeah, you know, and I think this is a, this is a good example. We look at an open-sided facility and you say, well, you know, do I really need ventilation? And probably not quite as critical here as with our babies. <coughs> but uh, I've, I've worked with a lot of facilities and we have these two ventilation systems in, uh, in these calf barns and where we're, the important thing is we're bringing fresh air in 24, hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360. We never shut the fans off. We're bringing fresh air in and we're, we're moving some of that bad air out from, the, from, those, from those heifers. And I think that's something that it's just really, really critical on these animals is that ventilation. The second one part was, what was water. that? Oh, the water. And I test water. I tell dairies, you test it every six months. And unless you're on a city water supply, but you test it and I've, I've just really, it's cheap to do and it's really great insurance. And availability to yep. the young and calves. And availability. They drink a lot more than Yeah, you look at, at, you know, the important thing is that water is in the back there but it's away from the feed. And I see places where the water is right next to the feed. And you reach in there and it's pretty nasty looking. You know, and this is something that's going in and cleaning that water, particularly for the babies, mm -hmm. is so, so, so important. The big problems that I see with water for calves are sodium, sulfates, manganese, sometime on some places, nitrates. But gosh, you gotta test that water and do something about it if it's a problem. You know, and these are, I think some common sense things that we tend to forget that are just as important as amino acid balance and, and some of the, the, the little details that we get worried about sometimes. So, very good. Thanks again, Jim. Glad to have you all here. You bet. Hopefully, we can move down the road with some more good Jersey research. There you go. Thanks again. Special thanks to uh, Jim Hufford for getting us going, getting us started on the Q&A today. And uh, um, Dr. James, let's just check your mic, make sure we can hear you. Are you there? We might need to unmute that line. A minute, there we go. There now we go. Yep, yep, Excellent. there we're good. Yep. So we'll just, we'll just pick right up where we left off on some of those questions. Um, so, so one question that we have is, 
Um, what is a major pitfall that you see heifer rear in heifer raising facilities or in heifer raising management? I mean, you definitely talked about some things to avoid uh, in the video, but what what sort of on a, a common challenge that you see out there? I think. You know, one of the biggest concerns that I have is is what I call this transition heifer. We're standing in front of those those heifers at Jim Hufford's place, and these are the ones that have been weaned a little bit. Uh, as we've started feeding more milk to heifers, uh, that transition maybe is a little bit abrupt in that uh, frequently we may go to once a day feeding. And, and when I work with some farms that have the auto feeders and we can gradually reduce that milk, uh, we make that transition a whole lot easier. Now, the thing that Jim does, um, <clears throat> I think they, they really uh, do a good job of tapering off his calves when they're on milk. And then, as I noted, he has a really high quality calf starter. And he really stays with that until these calves have really made that transition very well. But he's made that investment uh, in, uh, I think, in a high quality feed uh, that we've got there. He's got a nice set of, of really transition of facilities. If you'll notice that barn we were on, those animals move through those pens. And by the time they reach the far end, they're really ready to go out onto some pasture. And uh, Jim does have sufficient amount of pasture that, that's available for those heifers. And, and, uh, and they make that transition really quite well. So I think looking at a, a whole system, so we don't have any uh, um, shortcomings in, in, in what we're doing. Yeah, well, a, a kind of a follow-up question to that is um, how, because not everybody has a facility like that, not everybody has that nice grassy hay, yeah. and maybe, maybe not everybody um, is, is, you know, has the available or chooses, I should say, to use a high quality starter like that quite as long. So give us some tips on how to know that the heifers are ready to switch to either fermented forage or to pasture. Yeah, and I, th this is one where everybody <laughs> kind of looks funny at me and, and said there, there are no stock answers on that. You have a couple things. And I think, first of all, you know, if I'm really cutting it to the bone, um, I like to keep them on that calf starter that they've been on uh, when they were on milk for probably at least a month until I know that they've really got some pretty strong appetites. And then I think we can shift to something that might be a little bit more economical. Uh, but the problem that I see on some places is we've taken that too far. Uh, in other words, we've gone to some... Uh, feed ingredients that are just really pretty low cost. They're dusty. I see animals actually separating some of the ingredients. I've seen them picking corn out of a, out of a grower ration uh, because the rest of it was just so unpalatable. And uh, now the other one you, you bring up and I think is very good, and that's fermented feed. And, and for a lot of places, we like to get them on that. So some of the real key things on the fermented feed is, is we really need to avoid wet, really wet silages because uh, quite frequently there may be an undesirable fermentation where we might see a little bit of butyric acid and it gets kind of stinky. And those, we, we just really, really cannot feed to, to heifers, to, to these young animals. It's gonna really hurt intake. So we like to see something drier where we know we've got a good fermentation, at least 30% dry matter or more. And uh, so we look at corn silage or we look at, at maybe some small grain silage. Small grain silage can really fit in very well. Barley, triticale, rye silage can really help us to have a very economical uh, uh, heifer ration, particularly if it's maybe a little bit lower in energy and uh, can really work quite well and, and make a nice convenient ration for, uh, uh, for heifers. And then as, as you wanna transition a little bit, you can have a base mix and maybe top dress a little bit of, of uh, grain on top of it for the younger ones, but where we can make a, a, you know, a base mix and, and have something that we can put in a mix wagon. And a lot of this depends on our herd size. So now the one caution that I have, and I've run into this several times, is some people like to feed some just absolutely beautiful um, 
alfalfa hay to these weaned calves. And what they'll do is they'll actually sort for the leaves and leave the stems. And so we're winding up with, with some very, very digestible leaves. And they'll get a bit of what I'll call some nutritional diarrhea, but they'll get pretty loose. And now that can work okay if we can chop it up and, you know, and mix it up in a kind of in a TMR to use some alfalfa, but then we do lose a lot of the nutritional value and because we're going to lose some of those leaves as dust during mixing. And uh, uh, so that's one problem that I really see with some wean calves is feeding them that alfalfa and, and they, they just don't eat the stems very well at all. And, uh, uh, and so that's a challenge. But the thing that I have to remember here is we're talking about jerseys all over North America or wherever. And so the forage resources really change a good bit depending upon where we are. And, and we've really got to, to, to look at what forages are going to best complement are going to best work out in our heifer system and not be, I guess, tied into, to, uh, to any one, to one, in, one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Really great. Next question really just picks right up where, where you left off there, um, looking at different regions. So would you have any suggestions when putting heifers on pasture at an early age? And I'd just also add that uh, those, the, the pictures of Jim's heifers, uh, especially his springers out there on pasture, uh, boy, did they look good. I mean, kudos to him. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and, yep. and how important, you know, how important is pasture in his system? So just but, a little bit of a discussion about pasture here. Yeah, and I think the real challenge with, with Jim is, is a phenomenal agronomist. And I'll, I'll give, we, we talk about Jim, but there's John Hufford too. And John's kind of takes some of the primary responsibility for, that's Jim's brother, for the agronomic side. And they're wonderful uh, crop farmers too. And so they do a great job in, in managing pasture and managing their land resources. Uh, and now we've had a pretty good grazing year in Virginia. <laughs> Sometimes mm -hmm. at the time that we give that, um, it looks kind of brown in August and we really don't have anything, you know, for feeding those heifers. I mean, they're down to the dirt and that's one of the real challenges that we have. So how do you manage that, you know, that uncertainty? So we've got to be ready to, you know, to move in there with a, you know, some type of a supplemental feeding program uh, when we don't have that pasture resource that, that's available to us. And that, you know, that's, well, that's part of the, the I guess, the skill of, of really good dairy producers is how they manage risk and uncertainty during times. Uh, Jim doesn't do any irrigation, um, you know, and that's that's one way to counter some of that, although that's a little bit expensive when we go to irrigating pasture. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of a lot of differences from season to season in terms of our pasture availability. Now, I would note that some of the pictures that you saw there in the webinar were actually from Virginia Tech, and our animals go from an auto feeder barn to uh, to a barn that where we have free stalls. So they're moving out of a, uh, out of a group. They'll stay in that group, uh, that wean calf group, for about a month and a half or so. Then we'll move them over to free stalls. They're in there till they're about six months. And then ours go outside and they don't see a shelter until they come in to be, well, really until they're, almost until they're springers. But ours will stay outside almost year round. And, uh, and, and I think that's pretty much what Jim does. Here, there we go. I think we lost Jim. Bob, are you back with us? I think we might have lost uh, Dr. James, and if he joins back in, we we have a another question. But otherwise, I think we're going to go ahead and get some of our announcements done. So, um, just so you all know, this is uh, just one uh, in a series of webinars, and we will have another one on Thursday, October 25th, and it will also be at 3 p.m. Eastern. That next webinar will focus more on baby calf nutrition, and hosting the next webinar will be Gary Moore from Cargill uh, Animal Nutrition. And so be sure and watch your email, so yep, because nope. you'll see, there I we think, go. Yep. <laughs> I think we had a little, uh, 
shower band that came through there and, and cut us off from my internet connection. Yes, we certainly know you have some weather challenges down that way. So just finishing your thoughts about heifers on pasture. The last that we heard was that the heifers at Virginia Tech, they are outside until yep. it's time for them to come back into the barn with their first calf. Yep. During the winter, we may bring them in just for in terms of uh, for breeding until we get them pregnant. So we'll bring pre-breeding heifers in there for so there won't be inside for more than 60 days. But then they're outside until they come in with uh, with a group of springers and uh, close up cows. And so and, and that's pretty much how Jim does it. We do have uh, a lot of variation in weather, we winter weather, not quite as bad as it is in Wisconsin, but we'll get down to the, to, you know, below zero occasionally. And usually we don't have snow cover, but uh, we just have to learn how to manage that uncertainty and what our weather's gonna be. But that's a way yeah. to really cut our costs in terms of, of raising heifers, and again, I think one of the big things is that, um, uh, you know, this is, is so dependent upon where we live in, you know, in, in, in North America or, or wherever folks might be listening to, to this webinar. Yeah, next question has to do with age at maturity. I think um, all, all Jersey people kind of know this, as Holstein uh, herds might transition to becoming Jersey herds, they learn it. Um, yep. So, but but as a nutritionist myself, you know, I've I've coached a lot of Holstein herds to decrease the age at, at first calving, and we've got Holstein herds getting down to that 22 month average, maybe between 22 and 23. So, is is 22 still our target with jerseys, or is there a possibility that because we are growing them bigger and faster with more frame development? Are, is should we be challenging that window? What do you think, Dr. James? Well, and I think you you know you really talk about the good point, and that's maturity. So we look at what the mature size of our animals are, and uh, in our herd, and and that's going to vary from farm to farm. And and unfortunately, we really can't do too much within our farm. It gets a little complicated. But the important thing is, it's it's an interplay of of what we're looking at at mature weight, and when we want them to calve. And so don't think that, that every animal is ready to, you know, we, we need to look at, at where that animal, what age that animal is, how many days we have to our next um, milestone, so to speak, and what kind of gain we need to have to reach those, because those, those growth goals at those milestones are really somewhat independent of, of uh, um, age at first calving. In other words, you know, if we want that 22 month age at first calving, we need to back up our, our uh, uh, body weight goals at, uh, at, at breeding and, and at, at first estrus. And so I think that's something that just don't think we can breed everything at 22 months and not change our feeding program because then we're going to wind up with heifers that are too small and we're going to lose a lot of milk production during that first lactation because they've got to divert some of those nutrients to to enable that that first lactation animal to grow and that gets pretty expensive yeah really great and a follow-up question to that is um you know the importance of weighing not only calves but weighing heifers to mm -hmm. ensure that we actually are making progress towards those uh, milestones that you that you mentioned what percent of of producers are actually weighing any animals. And even, I mean, what I see is even fewer are measuring the weights on their heifers. Yep. Um, what kind of recommendations do you have for that? And if you can put an exclamation point uh, for us maybe behind the importance of that. Well, you know, it's funny. I do some work in Mexico with some of the larger firm farms in, in around Torreon, Mexico. So I was on a dairy and now, they had some jerseys actually there and we're transitioning to jerseys and and we start talking about body weights and and uh, the manager calls me into his office he fires up his computer and turns on the projector in the ceiling and we looked at average daily gains by group by year by farm and i thought wow. oh my gosh yeah and so the thing is you have to be able to do it to where it's not a uh, a horrible uh expense to do it in terms of labor. And so what that means, uh, and at Virginia Tech, we uh, we weigh animals. Now we tend to have a lot of student help, 
but we've got facilities where anytime we're running that animal uh, either onto a trailer or through a chute, we can slide in a set of true test scales or a set of electronic scales. And they, they have an electronic head associated with that. And so we'll enter that calf's RFID tag in the ear tag. And the only time we have to cross-reference that um, that RFID tag to the actual ID of the calf or the, the one we can see in the ear tag is the first time. And then we have a wand and every time that heifer comes into the into the stall or is weighed, we can wand it, it automatically transfers that body weight to an Excel file and we can calculate our average daily gains just real, real easily. So you have to figure out a way to do it to where it's not a, a tremendous expenditure. You know, the idea of tape weighing heifers, that's ridiculous. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's dangerous and it takes a lot of people to do it and it's not real accurate. And so there are ways of, of weighing those heifers that are um, relatively economical. Um, there's a heifer grower that I've known in New Zealand who has a business of custom rearing heifers and they weigh them once a month. They have a technician coming to the farm you know of their of their uh, growers in New Zealand and and that's all part of their business and so uh, otherwise you're going to wind up with some su some surprises and, mm -hmm. in other words with some some groups of heifers that just really bomb out pretty pretty poorly um, yeah. we, could, we could look at our heifers at Virginia Tech by pen and by by a month and really see where we have some problems showing up and and address those pretty quickly Great. Hey, good questions today and really great exchange. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bob James, for joining us today for the webinar. And please also extend our gratitude to the Hufford Dairy Farm and, uh, and, uh, and, and thank him for getting the Q&A started. That was just excellent. I'd like to remind everyone that watch your email. Uh, from the American Jersey Cattle Association, and also check the website, check the Facebook page for more information on the upcoming webinars. Also, if you missed the previous webinars, which covered transition cow as well as lactating cow nutrition, you can go find those videos at U.S. Jersey's YouTube channel. National All Jersey would also be interested to hear any feedback that you might have about how to improve this webinar series and, and what we should focus on in the future. And those comments can be sent to naj at usjersey.com. This is Laura Daniels, and I'm happy to have been your host here today. I'm looking forward to being with you once again uh, when our next webinar comes up in uh, just, oh, just a few weeks here. Thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye.